beginning of 1988, Sir Joshua Hassan had resigned as Chief Minister and leader of the ACR in December 1987 against the background of a highly controversial deal on the airport uh, which the United Kingdom had done with practically no consultation with the government of the day, even less with me as leader of the opposition. In January, an opinion poll has just been published which gives us about 57% of the vote for an election and the existing government 28%. The Foreign Office is looking at this scenario and preparing for the worst, the worst being me getting into government. Uh, in February, uh, the new Chief Minister Adolfo Canepa and leader of the AACR calls the election and a letter describing what's going to happen next is written by David Radford. Who is this David Radford? David Radford was one of the people involved in the Brussels Agreement and in the coordination with Spain on the implementation of the Brussels Agreement, which is what dominated the political life of our country between 1984 and 1988, with us in the GSLP opposing it every inch of the way. It was the sellout that for the first time spelled out negotiations on issues of sovereignty in the plural, the significance of which I will be explaining in later installments when we come to that. Bradford had been in Gibraltar. He had been here uh, with uh, somebody else from the Foreign Office to uh, look at our reactions on the eve of the uh, airport agreement and before we knew it was going to be signed. So this letter um, sets out the methodology of the Foreign Office in looking at the potential outcome of the election. And this is what Mr. Hartford is uh, recommending to the other mandarins in Whitehall, in Madrid, uh, the people in the system who give advice to ministers. He says, at the risk of gross oversimplification, it is fair to say we have interests in Spain and responsibilities in Gibraltar. Look at the distinction. Interest in Spain and responsibility in Gibraltar. Interest is a positive thing. Responsibility is a negative thing. Our objective, equally simplistically, is to avoid a clash between the two. The kind of conflict that I've been mentioning in my previous installments. To promote long-term growth in cooperation with Spain and Gibraltar, therefore, it follows that at any given time we should lean in the direction of whichever party shows a greater degree of moderation. This is a foreign office. We are a British overseas territory. The foreign office is responsible for our welfare, for the protection of our interests, for representing us internationally. And they are talking as if they were in the middle of a dispute, playing one side off against the other and saying, well, we will support not the territory for whose defense we are constitutionally responsible, but whichever of the two shows more moderation. That is to say, they would sit in judgment and if we were being too bolshy, they would back Spain. And if Spain was being too bolshy, they would back us. But look, Spain had been bolshy for years with a close frontier. Spain was being bolshy in pushing for things which we had to make concessions on in order to be entitled to what we used to have in the European Union before they came in. And yet they're putting us on an equal footing. So what are they saying? They, they recognize, very generous of them, that for the most part until then, it was Gibraltar that was being moderate and reasonable. It is possible, however, that the pendulum 
may now be about to swim. Now, what was happening in, on the 26th of February 1988 that made it possible that the pendulum might, might swing and that Gibraltar might not be so nice and that Gibraltar might not be so reasonable and that Gibraltar might not be given the greater degree of moderation. The election, that is what was happening. That is what could make the pendulum swing. He then says, if so, that is, if the DSRP gets elected, the UK interest will demand that we put pressure on Gibraltar. We haven't been elected yet. We haven't had an election. And already they were saying the policy has to be that if they uh, don't show moderation, in other words, if they don't do what we want them to do, if they don't do what we tell them to do, which was what they have become used to under the AACR until December 87, then we have to put pressure. And I have no doubt there were occasions when pressures were being put on Sir Joshua Hassan and the AACR to get them to fall in line and be moderate, which were never made public. But the pressures, in my case, were already anticipatory moves being prepared by them. They were concerned about the possibility of us wanting to leave the EEC, as it was then, the EU, as it is now. Something we are going to be doing now. Because one of the arguments that I was using on, on, from the opposition and on behalf of the GSLP was that we had been 30 years there before Spain and now Spain was coming in and laying down the conditions that we had to meet and the EU was not backing us. They were not standing up to Spain. They think that if we went out of road, which we didn't of course, it would have been a fatal error. However, they then go on, in general, whatever the outcome of the election, Mr. Radford says, I believe we shall do well to use the next few months when the, we are in a period of maximum freedom from electoral consideration in London, Madrid and Gibraltar, notice that Madrid is also a factor, to push for progress as determined in the light of British interests on all fronts. Mr. Radford, the Foreign Office man sent out to Gibraltar to talk to us about the airport deal and how good it was going to be for us. He said in a paper that is confidential that the strategy must be after the election, whoever gets in, whether it's the AACR or the GSLP, whoever gets in, it's the time to push for progress in the interests of Britain, not in the interests of Gibraltar, on all fronts, on all the issues that they've got pending, they say a new government comes in, now is the time to push them when they come in and they've got no experience. The old government comes in, well look, there are, the elections is over, now is the time to do it. And there are no elections in London, no elections in Madrid. And then, the final paragraph, of the Radford epistle says, I accordingly support the recommendation for any contacts with the new government of Gibraltar to be followed by a formal meeting of the Anglo-Spanish coordinators. The Anglo-Spanish coordinators were people from the Foreign Office in London and the Foreign Office in Madrid who were there to implement the Brussels process which was about our future, our self-determination, our economy, our country. Of course, we were going into an election saying, if we go in, we will uh, boycott the, 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 the process. And they knew it. And therefore, in the knowledge that I was promising to boycott the process, he says, an additional possibility which I would like to keep up my sleeve would be to have a further informal meeting with Celada, his counterpart in Madrid, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Madrid. If, for example, wild statements by Bolsonaro in the event of his electoral victory were to inflame sentiment in Madrid. 
the concern of Mr. Bradford and the concern of the Foreign Office of Amaius' government was that the person elected by the people of Gibraltar, who was already showing a support of 58%, you know, democracy is supposed to matter if somebody's got 58% and somebody's got 28%, that was not the legitimacy of the policies of which the people were voting, but that I shouldn't be saying wild things which might inflame my dream. Well, look, saying the truth was bound to inflame my dream. Saying we would not share our airport was bound to inflame. Those were the kind of wild things that they were already, uh, as, if you like, uh, stealing themselves up for this unexpected development which was going to be, as far as they, they, they could see, a spanner in the works of the sellout of Brussels. The letter itself has got a confidential uh, uh, label covering a secret document. So this part could be read by more people than the actual document attached, which goes into detail of the areas of potential conflict. And therefore, the second part, which is attached to this letter, is the secret UK ICE, which was restricted uh, and was not available for people to see in Gibraltar, as I explained in the previous installment. It starts off with the definition of what is in the document. Many pages and many chapters dealing with areas which we will be analysing in future installments. And they are the problems on the horizon. The problems on the horizon were there, whoever got elected, but they were going to be much more difficult for the UK government if the GSLB got in. And the introduction says, the elections to be held in Gibraltar on the 24th of March raised a distinct possibility for the first time of a major change in the direction in Gibraltar politics in many years. I would say, not just in many years, in the first time in our history we are going to, a government was going to stand up and say to the UK, we run the show in Gibraltar, we are the people of Gibraltar and this place belongs to us. In addition, we have over the last year or so postponed a number of important decisions until the elections were out of the way. So that there were sensitive, controversial decisions they wanted to push through. They wanted a moderate government, which was how they described our predecessor. They had not wanted to make things difficult for that moderate government to help them get elected. In spite of shelving all these issues, the polls show the government that they wanted was running at 28% and we were running at 57%. And now, they had to face up to it. And that's what we will look at in the next installment. What were the problems they had to face with the GSLP government? <laughs>